Uh, now we're going to move to uh, the panel uh, with, uh, where we're going to discuss in a bit more depth some of these issues that, uh, that came up and explore a little bit more uh, the approaches and attitudes of younger people and different generations uh, on these issues and sort of what the implications are for uh, thinking about public policy in the future. And to begin, uh, we're going to have two short presentations uh, about the views of younger generations and some of the techniques uh, for communicating with, these, uh, uh, with different generations on these long-term uh, issues. And our first speaker uh, will be uh, Alec Tyson. I'll put Alec, uh, ask him to come up in a, in a second. Uh, Alec is a senior researcher at the Pew Research uh, Center. Uh, and at the Pew Research Center, he's involved in all the stages of uh, the center's research from designing surveys uh, to writing and presenting uh, survey results. So he's very experienced on all of these issues. Uh, after him will be, um, uh, will be uh, Nat Kendall uh, Taylor. Uh, Nat is the chief uh, uh, CEO of uh, the Frameworks Institute. And Frameworks is uh, an institute that uses met the methodology of social and behavioral sciences to measure how people understand complex issues and test the ways uh, to reform, uh, to reframe these issues and to drive uh, change. So we've got two, um, uh, two presentations and then we'll be joined by three other people which I'll mention um, uh, in, after that uh, who will come up and we'll have a conversation uh, about the research work. So let's begin uh, with, uh, with Alec. All right, good morning everyone and uh, thank you for having me. I'm happy to be here. Uh, as mentioned, I'm at the Pew Research Center. I primarily work in public opinion, how people feel about issues, what their attitudes are on issues, and that'll be most of the data included in my presentation today. <coughs> so uh, the first place I want to start is with some of the contours of these generations. And some of this may be familiar to the audience, but I think it's really important to, to anticipate the discussion we're about to have. What are some of the key characteristics of these generations, and how might they inform their opinions on the topics we'll discuss today? Uh, first place to start is how much more racially and ethnically diverse the youngest generations are. Millennials and now this emerging new youngest generation of Gen Z, they're much, much more racially and ethnically diverse than the older generations. You can see a comparison here where early boomers, this, this young cohort of individuals, only 18% were non-white in 1968. In 2018, you can see that almost half of Gen Z at that same age range uh, was non-white. And, you know, that has a lot of implications. One of the things we know about racial and ethnic identities, it's closely tied to partisanship, right? And so one of the factors that drives the democratic imprint of these younger generations is the racial and ethnic diversity of these youngest generations. And you can see in this middle slide the party composition, which is a, a really important uh, starting point for, I think, all the reasons that we know. Gen Z and millennials, about 6 and 10, or almost 6 and 10, identify as Democrats or lean toward the Democratic Party. Partisanship is a bit more mixed in that those middle generations, Gen Z and baby boomers, and the silent generation tends to be a more conservative generation, a generation that leans towards the Republican Party. A lot of the work that we do at the Pew Research Center that I've done talks about political polarization, a concept or a theme you might be familiar with. And I, I think it's worth acknowledging that partisanship operates in a different way today than it did even 10 or 20 years ago. Uh, great research by a lot of folks, including Liliana Mason and others in academia or in our survey research field, that this identity is, is supercharged. It's more powerful than ever before in terms of the, the attitudes that correlate with it and how it informs your attitudes on other issues, and that includes the deficit in climate change. And then just a brief uh, point on the left here, just to show that the composition, which informs the partisanship, and the partisanship, which informs overall attitudes, we find big differences on a lot of policies by generation. This is a very simple question. It gets at your underlying views of uh, the role of government. Should the government do more to solve problems? The other side of the question, or basically it should do less and leave more to businesses and, and individuals. We find that large shares of Gen Z and millennials say they want to see a more active government, a sort of a, a, a democratically aligned viewpoint more mixed views in the middle generations, and a more conservative view among the silent generation. Other important differences uh, among the generations that I don't need to go in depth here on, but of course the youngest generations are less religiously affiliated, uh, more, less likely to attend religious services. A lot of important differences here, but these are some of the primary ones that I think will help frame the conversation we're about to have over, over the time we have here today. Okay, so let's get to some of the subject matter of the, of the panel today. 
starting with climate change. Now this slide shows your attitude about what you believe is going on. And you can see that 54% of Gen Z, 56% of millennials think that the earth is getting warmer and that it's due to human activity, right? And then you look down the slide and you see, well, that, that belief is a bit less wide held among Gen X and boomers and much less wide held among the silent generation. And then if you look at these other categories, that you know, some share thinks it's getting warmer, but it's due to natural patterns. Uh, some share thinks there's no evidence that the Earth is getting warmer. And I think it's worth noting the sizable share that says they're not sure. You know, that's an indication that this topic or the cause or the drivers of, of this phenomenon are not necessarily well known to all members of the public. And the other thing that I would say here is even among the youngest adults, Gen Z or millennials, 54 and 56 percent is not 95 percent, right? They, they, there's not unanimity even among the youngest generations that the cause of global warming is human activity. And that may or may not be surprising to some folks, but I think it's important to say, yes, they're more likely to view the issue in these terms, but even still, these, these shares are far from overwhelming, right? I want to talk a little bit about the, uh, the, par the politics or partisanship of, of climate change. A very simple question, uh, should dealing with climate change be a top priority for the President and Congress? And this is shown over time. You can see that among Democrats, about two-thirds of Democrats say it's a top priority for the President and Congress to deal with climate change. And that's up significantly over time. A little bit of fluctuation, but it's a very clear trend line. And then just a really different story among Republicans, right? That only about 2 in 10 Republicans say dealing with climate change is a top priority for the President and Congress. And there's not a lot of slope to this line. It's a pretty flat line. We're not seeing a lot of change uh, over time. I mean, maybe if you squint at it, you can maybe see a few points of change. But this is a pretty flat line. It's an uptick line in Democrats. And one thing that's doing, and it's consistent with the partisan uh, atmosphere we're in now, is the gap between Republicans and Democrats is bigger now than it's even been in the past, where it's becoming a much higher priority for Democrats. It remains a low priority for Republicans, and they're further apart or as far apart as they've ever been on that. I want to talk a little bit about, OK, you got, you got, you got generations, you got partisanship. What about generations within partisanship, right? Are young people within the parties different or the same? And the dots on this chart show generations among Republicans. And the, the richest blue dot is young Republicans, millennial Republicans. 36% of millennial Republicans think the Earth is getting warmer mostly due to human activity. That's significantly higher than, than older Republicans. About half of millennial Republicans say the government's doing too little to address uh, the effects of climate change. That's, that's greater than the share of older Republicans who say that. And young Republicans are less likely to favor expanding the use of oil and gas offshore drilling or oil and gas drilling. So it is true that within Republicans, younger Republicans tend to have a bit more liberal attitudes on climate and environmental issues. But you have this reference group over here in the, in the shaded highlight. This is all Democrats and Democratic leaners. It's important to remember that young Republicans are still very different from all Democrats. The younger Republicans still have more in common with other Republicans than they have with Democrats. And you might ask, well, what about age differences among Democrats? The reason they're not shown here is that they're very, very modest. You know, very similarly sized large shares of all Democrats across age cohorts take the views that we have shown here in the highlight. So yes, are there age div divisions within the GOP? Yes. Are younger Republicans a bit more liberal? Yes. But they are, they are certainly not normatively liberal or, or pro-climate when you look at a reference point like the other party, right? Oop, I've gone too fast there. All right, so I'm going to pivot over to the national debt and deficit, right? Starting on the left side of this slide, there's some consensus, or there is consensus across generation, that the debt will grow over the next 30 years. And you might think that, well, that's kind of an obvious thing to say. But increasingly in this environment, sometimes we see true disagreement between partisanship or other groups on what the facts of the matter are. Here, at least we can start off and say that all generations agree that they expect the debt to grow larger in the next 30 years. But then we start to see some differences across generations in terms of prioritization. And the pattern you'll see here is that it's older folks, not younger folks, who put the highest priority on addressing the debt and deficit. This middle slide, uh, percent saying the national debt, it's a top priority to reduce it for the quality of life of future generations. I mean, this, this question is even cast forward-looking. You might think it would prime some younger folks to, to assign higher importance to it. 
It really doesn't. You see that the silent generation and the oldest generation is, is the most likely to say this is a top priority, and it's actually millennials who are the least likely to say that this is a top priority for future generations. And then it's a very similar slide on the right panel here, which is a, a, a close cousin of the slide we just discussed. Percent saying the federal budget deficit is a very big problem for the country today. If only to just reinforce the same pattern we see, if you word the question slightly differently or with a slightly different emphasis, you get the same pattern. I want to talk a little bit now about the politics of the budget deficit. I think it's important to say that there's a regime effect over concern about the budget deficit. This is, these lines show among Republicans and among Democrats, the, the percent who say each should be, it should be a top priority to reduce the budget deficit. And in the Clinton era, not a lot of difference between those two lines. Could reflect any number of things, less intense partisanship, maybe a better fiscal environment. But beginning in the George W. Bush era, these lines diverge, right? In the Bush era, Democrats were much more concerned about reducing the federal budget deficit. In Obama's administration, these views flipped. Concern over the deficit among Republicans skyrocketed, right? And you really start to see a big gap between the two parties. We're in a moment now where both parties aren't really all that concerned about the deficit, but you do see a, a beginning of a change in the trajectory of that Democratic line ticking up towards a bit more concern where that Republican line continues to slope down. And so I think that's just a reality, that the, that the concern over the budget deficit vacillates depending on the, on the partisan makeup of the White House or Congress, and that could be one reason why it's hard to get sustained momentum on an issue where, well, it really depends who's in power to, that's related to how much I care, how much a partisan would care. And then the final slide I, I want to make, well, maybe I'll pause back on this one just for a moment. We talked a little bit about intra, intra party generational differences on climate, right? Are younger and older people different within party? There's not a lot of that on the deficit, and to the extent that it is, it's that older member, older Democrats are a bit more concerned than younger Democrats, and it's even fainter among Republicans, but to the extent that there's a pattern, it's older Republicans more so than younger Republicans who are concerned about the deficit. So that's a piece of context for generation and partisanship. And then I'll wrap up with uh, this slide, which, which may be obvious for those who work closely in Washington or maybe on the Hill, public has very little appetite for spending cuts. And uh, periodically, we, we ask about some specific areas, uh, including something like assistance to the needy around the world. You might hypothesize, well, OK, the public might be willing to cut there. Or you might have your own ideas, but maybe that's one area they'd be willing to cut. No, only 28% would be willing to cut funding there. Uh, a majority, about 68%, say they want to keep that spending the same or increase the spending. So a little bit of a reminder of the very limited public appetite for specific spending cuts, which of course would be at least one piece, one piece, not the whole picture, but at least one piece of a program to address the debt and deficit. So I'll leave it there for now, and I look forward to the panel discussion and, and questions uh, further down the panel. Thank you. All right, hello and good morning, everyone. How's everybody doing? Good, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so I, I first of all want to thank, thank Stuart for uh, allowing me to be part of this really awesome panel. Those first two presentations were great, and I promise to do my best not to make you second guess the wisdom of that decision. Um, but uh, I'm going to tell you, I'm going to start by telling you a little bit more about myself and where I come from, and that's not because I think you care. Uh, but that kind of my disciplinary background, where I come from, is really important in understanding why I'm standing up here and about to take up the next 12 minutes of your lives. So I am, by training, what is called a psychological anthropologist. And there's some knit brows out there. But what that means is that I study culture and how it influences the way that people think. How people use culture to process information, to make meaning of messages, and importantly, to formulate and reach decisions. At, at Frameworks, the organization that I lead, I study two different things. So I study um, how people understand complex social issues like the budget, like the economy, like addiction, like climate change, um, uh, public health issues. And I also study how the way that we communicate affects those understandings, which is really the science of framing. Um, and I've done this work for 12 years now, and I counted this morning. I've worked on 40 social issues over those 12 years, and I would say that almost each and every one of those issues is plagued by the difficult task of communicating about prevention. So it is exceedingly difficult to get people pumped 
about doing a lot of work and spending a lot of money so that we see nothing. So what I'm going to do today is I'm going to take a, a step back. I'm not actually going to talk about millennials at all. Um, and I'm not only going to talk about budget and climate change issues, but um, I'm going to take you through a, a very quick answer to the first question of why I think the, uh, the issue or the idea of framing is so important in this discussion. And then I'm going to quickly go through four things that I've been thinking about that I think are really important um, as we are asking these questions about how to frame, about how to create motivation to act now for future effect. Uh, and so the reason that framing matters is quite simply that the way that we stunt, understand issues is highly frame dependent. That understanding is frame dependent. And I realize that's kind of academic ease. It's kind of gobbledygook that someone with a PhD maybe once said, and it is. So this is a, a quote by one of the founding fathers of the, the field of framing, whose name is Shanto Iyengar. But what this means in a way that makes more sense to me in a more direct way is that um, it's not just what you say that matters, but how you say it that is of incredible consequence and can frequently determine how whether the stuff that you have to say, the knowledge, the information that you have actually does the things that you want it to do when you are trying to communicate it. Uh, so I'm going to take uh, one quick example of this that's related to prevention, kind of related about how we talk about now to affect the way that people support future issues and actions. And I'm going to tell you about some work that we've done around the issue of framing child mental health. So this is an issue where most Americans um, don't even really believe that very young children can have mental health. So that's one challenge we're trying to, to conquer here. The other one is that there's very low public support for policies for using public funds to do things now that would support the mental health of children such that it has future um, effects and impacts on things like education, health, uh, well-being. And so our task here in this experiment that I'm about to show you is those two things. So how do we take child mental health and make it more of a salient issue for people? And how do we increase people's support for a set of, in this case, about 15 evidence-based policies that support child mental health? So this is an online experiment. It's conducted with about 6,000 Americans selected to be nationally representative. Um, and the way that it works is each of those 6,000 people logs onto the experiment. They get randomly assigned to hear one of two different messages. That's what you see along the horizontal axis of this graph. So some people log on, and they get randomly assigned to read a message that is uh, about a child mental health program that's framed with the value of future progress and social prosperity. So they would hear something like, it's important that we do a better job supporting uh, or dealing with child mental health because, and we wouldn't say it in this way, children are our future. Right? The things that we do now to support their solid and stable mental health will determine our ability as a society to, to be successful in the future. Um, another group gets randomly assigned to hear, uh, to read basically the same description of the program, although the lead-in, the frame on the issue is different. So instead of what you just heard, the frame of vulnerability would be something like, it's important that we do a better job of addressing child mental health because children are our most vulnerable citizens. They deserve our empathy and our compassion, and we must do better. And then there's a third condition who gets no message, the control condition. And the control condition is the way that we compare and see the effects of those messages. So what you're going to see on the next click here, what I think, and what I imagine Alec will think based on your presentation, are two gorgeous green bars are going to appear on the screen. And those green bars are going to show you the effect of hearing those different messages on people's perception of the issue salience, how important it is, and the degree to which people are supportive for these evidence-based solutions. So I don't, I know where we are, uh, but I don't know the statistical acumen of this audience, so I'm going to give you a quick stats lesson. Up is good, <laughs> and down is not so good. So you notice two bars, see two bars, and you notice two things. So first of all, that value of future progress and social prosperity is increasing the issue salience. It's boosting people's support for those policy solutions. That is, that is the good news. But you also, I'm sure, had your eyes wander towards the right-hand side of the screen where the news is less good. So the value of vulnerability is not only statistically indistinguishable from the control, which is no message, but rather it depresses people's support for those policies. It makes people less willing than those who heard nothing at all to support the things for which these scientists and experts are advocating. That is not our goal when it comes to how we use our communications resources. So the kicker is that in a subsequent piece of analysis where we looked at all the fields, external facing materials over a two year period, all their websites and pamphlets and newsletters and op-eds, guess which value is used in over 90% of those materials? 
So we'll let that be a rhetorical question in this audience. So it is the value of vulnerability. So what people have been doing, had been doing for a very long time with retrospectively is a shocking amount of resource is advancing a value that not only wasted those resources, but that used those resources in a way that was antithetical, that was opposite to the direction in which they were advocating. So that's all to say that framing matters. Hopefully we can say, we can say yes, if I had more time, I have many awesome examples with other colored uh, bars that I could show you. But I'm going to move into the second question now, which is some things that I've been thinking about recently. Well, I shouldn't say recently, because some of these are about 12 years old. About um, recommendations, ideas that we can think about, and many have been mentioned in the previous two presentations, for framing now for the future. So we're going to spin through these really quickly, uh, but I want to first just uh, highlight, and I imagine most of the people, because of the room that we're in, know a number of these challenges and are familiar with them, but communicating about the future, about acting now to do things for future benefit is uh, an exceedingly difficult task from a cognitive and cultural perspective. So there are things like normalcy bias, our tendency to see the future in terms of the way that things are, delay discounting, um, our willingness to, to always accept less now than wait for more later. Um, as well as more cultural things, the cultural model, the cultural thread, stream of thinking about, uh, of thinking very fatalistically about the future, and of thinking uh, of issues in terms of individual uh, willpower and choice, which makes um, kind of changing those situations exceedingly hard to engage with. But the first thing that we can do um, is, and, and uh, Congressman Kilmer talked about this, is to be really careful to consistently and persistently connect actions now with outcomes later and to repeat that. So there were a number of, co of comments in Congressman Kilmer's presentation that were about repetition. And I will just say that 60 years of communications research has found the single thing that is most predictive of how people think is how many times they've heard something. Um, and so the field in which we've done a lot of work of child mental health over the last 15 years has been really successful in this connection between now and later and really, really successful in, compete in repeating these kinds of messages. And a lot of that has been through this familiar metaphor um, of brain architecture, right? And once people hear the idea of brain architecture, which is a metaphor, what we call an explanatory metaphor, a number of things start dropping into place. So they start thinking about early childhood issues as um, the word early being really important, as it building the foundation now that shapes everything to come, the importance of the inputs now and their quality and determining the quality of outcomes. They think about the importance of timing. They think about it as an active process. And over time, the repetition of that metaphor has come to shift the policy discussion and increase people's support for investments now shaping outcomes later. It's also come out of work of a uh, very famous uh, economist, James Heckman, who's done a lot of work around the kind of the 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 wisdom of investing now dollars in terms of the payoff later. The second reason, or the second thing that we can do is, and it's already been talked about as well, is what's called uh, legacy framing. And so this is work that's really about forcing people, priming people to think in a personalized way about the future. So it's asking people to think about things that you do now and their effect on the future and the future that you care about. So there's a series of studies by the authors that you see in the lower right-hand corner of the screen, which has shown that when you, when you prime people, when you activate this kind of legacy thinking, in this case, in an experimental study that asked people to write and think about what you want future generations to remember you by, people who were primed in that way were, to a statistically significant degree, more willing to engage in what's called pro-social actions, actions that would solve climate change, and behaviorally, they are more likely to donate to organizations doing that work. And this is the only priming that's going on. They write a paragraph that asks them to imagine the effects that they would want future generations to experience because of actions that they are performing now. We've also seen this in our work on climate change, where among other messages, we've tested two messages. The first being the kind of dominant message that's falling out of favor slightly now, but was certainly dominant I'd say for most of the last 10 years, the kind of science says message for why climate change is important. And unsurprisingly, this did not produce findings of statistical significance. But a different message that asks people to think about acting now, in this case to prevent uh, or protect the health of future generations, has dramatically higher effects across a number of outcomes that people care about when they communicate about climate change. Third 
is to spend time on solutions, not just problems. And this is one that I think as social issue communicators across issues, we fall victim to and are guilty of. And there's really interesting work by a group of social psychologists that work on a, a model of decision making called extended parallel processing model uh, that looks at this. They look at the way that variations in terms of how urgent an issue is presented to be cross or relate to how efficacious people can see themselves as being on the issue. So efficacy is the idea that you can do something to remediate, to fix a problem. And they find, or unsurprisingly to me, maybe surprisingly for people who do urgency-based messages, that when you have urgency, 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 and very low efficacy, very limited sense of solutions, you have fatalism, right? You have peace, I'm out, right? I'm not going to engage with that. I know there's a big pile of social problems over here. I'll just put yours in there, and I'm out. You don't get my, my cognitive resources. Unfortunately, as was discussed earlier this morning, the answer is not just to flip the script and kind of go all woo-woo, hopey, changey, solutions, rainbows and unicorns are everywhere. Because when you do that, in line with what Congressman uh, Kilmer said this morning, you get snore and bore, very low motivation. This research has found, and this is the most interesting thing for you all, for all of us here today, that there is this, this kind of magic persuasive combination where you're able to balance senses of urgency. This is a problem, it is real, it matters to you, it needs to be addressed, with equally robust senses of efficacy, that there are things that can be done, solutions are there, this is not an intransigent problem. And when you do that, you have these magically, this is being a bit dramatic, but these incredibly persuasive messages that get people to lean in, that start to move their thinking about solutions. So last but not least is the importance of explanation, that I think when we, when we think about these issues, too little of our attention gets focused on explaining and making people smarter, and I don't mean that in a patronizing way, I mean that in a respectful way about how these issues work. And so we've done some work in, uh, in the UK on issues of the economy, and I'm gonna show you just one really quick finding about this. Um, in which in an experimental setting, uh, we, we had a control condition that was exposed to nothing but asked questions um, about uh, the economy and we found overwhelmingly they had naturalistic understandings of the economy, that it just is this thing that does its thing by way of nature. They, for, they, they were therefore very fatalistic about the future and very disengaged. So another group of participants were randomly assigned and exposed to a metaphor about the economy as being something that is programmed and can be reprogrammed, so kind of a computer-based programming metaphor. And the results of that were unbelievably different. They saw the economy as something that was intentionally designed and that could be redesigned. They were efficacious about the future, and they were much more willing to engage in order to fix it. And so I will end there just with one of my favorite quotes about framing that comes from a philosopher, University of Chicago, Richard Rorty, who said that a talent for speaking differently rather than arguing well is the chief instrument for cultural change. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Nat. Um, let me uh, ask uh, all the panelists to come up, including Alec, and let me just uh, quickly introduce the panelists you haven't already uh, been introduced to. Um, Sitting roughly in the middle uh, is um, Leila uh, Zaydan, who's Chief Operating Officer of the Millennial uh, Action Project. And as I said before, uh, MAP is uh, a co-host of this uh, event today. Uh, prior, uh, prior to joining uh, MAP, she was the Managing Director at Generations Progress, which is the youth advocacy arm uh, of the Center for American Progress. Uh, at the far end is uh, my colleague, uh, Molly uh, Reynolds, who's a senior fellow here at, uh, at Brookings in the governance uh, uh, department. And uh, uh, she's, her emphasis of work uh, at Brookings is on how congressional rules and procedures uh, affect policy outcomes and is very much involved in our work in, in uh, budget process reform. Uh, then in addition, uh, next to her is uh, Eric uh, Harris, who's senior advisor and communications director uh, for the office of California Representative Jimmy Gomez. Uh, and Eric has led professional development workshops uh, for congressional staff and has worked as a public affairs strategist with a range of nonprofits, uh, political campaigns, and cause oriented uh, initiatives. So I'll join them and then we'll have a conversation.
Thanks. So I'd, I'd like to start with getting our uh, most recent panelists, our three panelists who just came up, to get their reactions uh, a little bit to what they, they just heard. And maybe I can start with you, uh, uh, Molly. Um, from what you've heard, what specifically, in terms of thinking about congressional process, uh, could capture what you've heard from Matt uh, and from Alec on this one? So um, <clears throat> thank you, <clears throat> Stuart, for, um, for having me. I actually think for me what both um, Nat's comments and Alec's comments and Representative Kilmer's comments really highlighted are some of the ways in which um, Congress may actually not be the right uh, messenger for thinking about um, how to convince younger Americans of um, issues around the, the gravity of the debt. And I say that for a couple of reasons. One is that Congress is simply not very good at legislating to solve long-term problems. Um, some of this has to do with one of the, so one of the points um, Nat made about how um, his work and the work of um, others in his field highlights the need to focus on solutions over problems. That's not one of Congress's kind of core competencies, particularly in the public discourse. Um, uh, Representative Kilmer talked a fair amount about the credibility of members of Congress and other politicians as messengers on some of these issues. But for me, it comes back to this notion that at the end of the day, um, members of Congress um, are elected officials. They're, they're motivated. Um, by uh, trying to get reelected, and that it can be hard to get people who are trying to get reelected to vote for imposing direct costs on people now in exchange for long term benefits in the future. So, the easiest choices that members of Congress can make are those that involve immediate gains and put off long term costs in part because they, um, they involve less uncertainty. So the, there are things structurally about Congress that really mean that it's difficult for Congress to certainly act on um, issues that have very high long-term co um, uh, long costs and that's for which solving them would impose substantial short-term costs. Um, I'll also point to the, the comment that Representative Kilmer made that it, about how it's not clear that Congress itself cares a lot about the long-term debt as an issue at the moment. Um, the degree to which um, particularly things like the 2017 tax bill um, have indicated that you know, Congress is not particularly fiscally responsible at the moment um, affects the kind of credibility that um, Representative Kilmer was referencing around um, having members of Congress try to be um, uh, credible messengers um, on this issue. And then the last thing I'll say is that um, the, the issue of the debt and the deficit <clears throat> does have certain um, uh, partisan dynamics that I think also make it difficult for members of Congress to, um, to act as credible messengers on the issue. So um, Alec mentioned before that addressing the national debt is a much higher priority for Republicans at the Republican survey respondents at the moment than it is for Democrats. However, that um, the degree to which that's a, a high priority fluctuates with the partisan control of um, uh, governing institutions in a way that's less true for um, for climate change. Alec referred to these as as regime effects, and so. Um, Alec also mentioned the degree to which for younger, um, the younger generations, they're more likely to, to lean democratic. So sort of when you put all of these things together, um, I, um, I was really interested in um, Representative Kilmer's comments about the need to find perhaps different messengers um, to, if not replace members of Congress, certainly to work with members of Congress um, in figuring out how to more credibly convey to younger generations the extent of the problem. Well, that's very cheerful. <laughs> uh, so, so just bearing in mind that uh, Nat told us to uh, focus on uh, on solutions uh, rather than problems. I wonder if you just if you could just elaborate for just a moment, kind of on on how you would imagine Congress being more receptive to this. In other words, what would have to happen for pressure from somebody from the outside? 
to have more impact on, on Congress in this way? How would it have to yeah, operate differently? So is, I think is, is, is the budget process part of that? Is it something else? So I'm, I'm, not, um, I'm not sure that there are a lot of changes in the institution itself. Um, I think, um, and here I would go back to um, what Representative Kilmer had us do at the top of his remarks and think about how we imagine uh, the effects of climate change versus how we imagine the effects of the, effects of the debt. And the idea that for voters, I think, frankly, of all ages, um, but even more so of, um, of younger generations, there's just not this strong connection between the policy consequences of um, not addressing our long-term fiscal challenges and um, the, the nature of the problem. And so to the, I think for us to see um, action in Congress, that link needs to be a lot stronger in the minds of voters. Um, that it needs to be much clearer to voters what will happen um, if, uh, if we don't address um, some of the long-term fiscal challenges. I will say at the same time that for younger voters, um, it's also, you know, Representative Kilmer talked about his sort of aha moment about whether or not Social Security will be around um, when he retires and certainly when his children retires. And that when you look at um, data, Pew has some data on this, for... Um, people um, under 50, uh, the number of the, the share of those um, individuals who think Social Security will be around when they retire is pretty low. Mm -hmm. um, so um, on one level, voters are already convinced that these things um, aren't going to be around for them in the future. Uh, and so, but sort of trying to untangle that knot a little bit about uh, what's the, what is really the policy connection, what are the policy consequences for voters of not um, of not taking action in this area, I think is um, probably, um, to my mind, the most um, important thing that we could do to try to um, get Congress to be more active. Sure. Uh, Eric, you have to deal with these issues on a daily basis as, uh, in terms of your communications. Uh, is Molly right? Uh, 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 should we just give up on you in terms of being able to uh, <laughs> I'm do a, anything? I'm a congressional optimist. I would okay. never suggest giving up on Congress. <laughs> no, I'm good giving up. We're good. All right. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but, but how do you convey these, uh, these very issues? Uh, you know, it's interesting. Uh, I've heard sentiments before expressed that Congress isn't the right messenger for mm -hmm. this, and I think we're um, asking the wrong question. It's not that is, should Congress be the sole messenger. It's how should Congress work in parallel with other stakeholders to make sure that we're underscoring the severity of the issue. I want to remind people that uh, elected officials aren't just politicians. We are on the front lines of constituent services. We are the ones who are fielding calls from constituents about their Social Security benefits, their VA benefits, their SNAP benefits, TANF and WIC and other social programs that we have to uh, also remind ourselves are being used uh, to balance the budget uh, by certain people in Congress. Um, so it's not whether or not they're the right communicators. It's, are we on the right team of communicators? And I think another part of that is really understanding. I, I love that we're here at Brookings talking about um, how we communicate um, the severity of climate change and the budget and the deficit to millennials. What would be great is if we, as a country, figured out how to better just talk to millennials. Um, we are storytellers. We are content consumers. So you know, I worked for Congressman Gwen Moore, who always said, "Meet them where they're at." And um, what I'm not seeing um, from certain members of Congress is that um, ideology of being able to talk to us where we are, be able to talk to us the way that we communicate. Um, so I love that we're talking about this, but also how are we communicating these issues? Um, I remember this, uh, the food stamp challenge, the SNAP challenge. Mm -hmm. This was a great way for people who didn't really understand supplemental nutrition assistance, um, but when they're asked to only spend $4.15 a day on their food, like someone who has SNAP benefits, well, now you have skin in the game. Now we are creating a story for us to be able to be a character in. And we get to feel what it's like to go into a grocery store and look around and know what our limitations are. Um, we should also be thinking past just that, uh, that proximal idea, though. We should also be thinking about what happens when we don't have $4.15 a day to be able to go to a grocery store because other people have used SNAP or different social services as a way to balance the budget. And uh, I work for Congressman Jimmy Gomez, who represents Los Angeles and downtown Los Angeles. We have some of the poorest people in this country. We have some of the most wealthy in this country. Um, the way that the congressman communicates is by storytelling. It's being able to talk about his interactions with our constituents and what's at stake in these very um, stark times that we live in. And I'd say one more thing to that. Uh, I was really impressed with both presentations um, 
on the data that was presented here today, I mean, I'm seeing two different things. I'm seeing that uh, millennials like myself and Generation Z wants government to help out. They want government to be an active participant in their daily lives. I think that does underscore the need for us to be a part of this conversation to communicate intentionally. Um, and I think the other presentation about data framing is also really important. It's how are we talking about these things to ensure, like Congressman Kilmer said, that we're connecting the dots for everyone so that everyone understands that they're a stakeholder and that they have skin in the game. I think Congress is the right place to start that. And we take panels like this and organizations like Brookings and Pew to take all of that data together uh, and work in parallel to be able to achieve that objective. I should remind everybody that, that the actual title of this panel is How to Speak Millennial. Mm -hmm. um, so I think we should really have sort of simultaneous translation uh, going on on this. And I kind of mean that almost seriously because uh, certainly those of us, and I emphasize I'm a baby from the baby room generation and I'm here at a think tank and so on. We certainly within Brookings, like most areas, really struggle with how do people who are focused on data, on analysis, on really seeing these long-term pictures, how do we convey these to this? So it's a very real issue about uh, how people in the research community and the, and the think tank community, I think, should, should really uh, need to really sort of focus on different ways of doing that, which are consistent with what we do as, as organizations. Uh, Leila, you've spent a lot of time dealing very directly with uh, younger generations and mobilizing them ar uh, around issues. Uh, kind of from what you've heard this morning, uh, how do you, what's your reaction to what you heard, particularly from Nat and, and Alec on this? Yeah, so, so thank you again for even just hosting this event, I think, is, is so important because it underscores such an important problem where we're, we're starting to chip away at a net. Um, you said it in the answer to the, the first question of your presentation, which is that understanding is frame dependent. And I think that is the entire premise upon which my organization, Millennial Action Project, was, was founded. And for those of us in the room who, who aren't familiar with it, um, back in 2013, we launched Congress's first ever bipartisan caucus for young elected officials with the idea precisely being that the framework of tackling problems in a left-right uh, frame was not working. And so instead, what if what if we framed it in a future frame? And that totally removes the baggage of all of these other arguments that you start to assign to individual issues. Um, the, the how becomes less important and the what starts to take on a lot more, a lot more value and you're able to focus on it um, in a much more targeted way. And I think millennials are especially um, well suited to, to engaging in this way. Um, Alec, in your presentation, you mentioned that, um, and, and you just said the same thing, that young people are open to, to government solutions to some of these big, meaty problems. Um, at the same time, we're so skeptical of big institutions, and we, we have a lot of reason to be quite cynical. And so I think we, because we are able to hold two truths at the same time, uh, we need to pivot and, and think about different ways of kind of framing these issues big issues like climate, big issues like the debt. Um, you know, one, one analogy, I don't know who here has a cable package. Um, yeah, not a ton of people. I do. <laughs> Case I know, in point. I, know, I, know. I knew you were going to say that. <laughs> well, Simply. you know, there's, there's maybe a few channels that we want to watch or a few things that we're interested in, but there's more likely a lot more channels that we don't necessarily care about or maybe channels that we very specifically avoid. I don't spend a ton of time watching like the MLB Classic channel, for example. And good. instead, <laughs> go Nats. Um, but instead, we're, we're subscribing to things like Netflix or selecting our, our options more a la carte. And I think that's a good analogy for how we should be thinking about issues and tackling these big problems moving forward. We're trying to sell a cable package to a streaming generation, and we need to kind of pivot to recognize that we need to, to move the frame. Mm, that's a very good analogy. <laughs> uh, yes, I mean, my daughters who are both uh, millennials, uh, uh, I'm always, I, I have to text them because they don't respond to anything other than a text. Uh, even if they're in the same room, uh, I have to text them about exactly, you know, how do I change this channel and get what I want and this kind of thing. I don't know. They just do it for me, and that's, I, I find, very, uh, much more simple. Uh, I'd just like to um, pick up on, on something which, uh, which I've heard in the research, and I wanted to see if you all agree that this is the case, which is one of the interesting things about younger people, and particularly in the issue of, of, uh, of climate change, 
is the feeling, in part probably because of, of the disdain, the, sus the suspicion of larger institutions and so on, the desire to actually do something yourself to, mm -hmm. to help deal with the issue. So, you know, getting a, a fuel efficient car, uh, worrying about your carbon footprint, uh, and so on and so forth. Uh, and um, how might that be translated, if it's true, and maybe Nat, you want to jump in on this, how might this be translated into something like the debt and deficit? Is there something that uh, younger people do or could do to, do to make a difference in their own mind for the future? I think it kind of weaves into this whole issue of solutions. You know, what is it you're trying to achieve and what can I personally do to help get there? Is it possible to offer some ideas for younger people about actions they could do, given that Molly's told us to give up on Congress, uh, you know, others have told us that, that uh, you know, you can't look at a package deal and so on, you've got to look at individual steps. What could those steps be and are they meaningful? Anybody want to jump in on that? It's open to anybody. Yeah, register to vote. So okay. I think that's well, the first that's thing. I mean, to become an active member of this democracy and to make sure that your voice matters and that it's heard and that you also work with other groups and other stakeholders who can help amplify that voice. I think that's a, a major, it's great to be able to compost and it's great to be able to um, get a fuel efficient car um, and to mitigate your own carbon footprint and that's great. Um, but we also need to also understand that there's not a one size fits all approach to these issues and that we have to be very intentional about um, what type of strategies we're offering to younger generations and generations like mine. Um, because, you know, our, I was figuring out whether I was going to say this or not, but I think I am. Um, say it. <laughs> Do it. Our <laughs> bullshit radars are incredibly honed. Um, and we are, we, we've been watching television for most of our lives, and we see a lot of elected officials mm -hmm. tell us one thing and others tell us another. We have a president who says things that, we laugh off now and that we've normalized in a certain way by saying, you know, it's just the president being the president, but for younger people, it's the president of the United States saying things and that they're, and they're taking that to heart and they're saying that that, that potentially is true. So um, we need to be truthful, we need to be stark, we can't be hyperbolic, um, and unfortunately, the current administration doesn't really make that easy for us um, on any given day. Um, but if we need a, a plan, a strategy on how young people can, uh, uh, can address growing deficits, it's to become a member of this democracy and register. No, I think that's right. And again, I would never suggest giving up on Congress. But I do think that when we talk about, again, what motivates members, um, they do have to, you know, in the House, stand for re-election every two years. They have a lot of incentives to pay attention to and respond to the issues that their constituents are telling them to care about. And so um, for younger Americans, making sure that you are one of those people who your elected official is hearing from um, is, I think, incredibly important. Um, there is, um, uh, uh, Pew has documented the degree to which the share of the electorate that is in younger generations is growing. So I think we're sort of in that, um, we're, we're going down that path already. But um, I would, I would um, completely agree that that's one of the most important individual level behaviors that folks can engage in um, if they care about these issues. Mm -hmm. I also think just, you know, Mr. Kilmer's point about the solution being localized is so important. And that's perhaps why we've seen so much success at the state level in moving uh, energy or, or climate related um, bills. And I think the more that we can put our messengers in people's neighborhoods, in their communities, talking about things that they can see with real impact, whether it's potholes on their street or other, um, you know, issues that are being neglected because of this kind of uh, larger uh, existential issue, the more we can localize it, the more we can start to drive the, the urgency and draw a bright line between registering to vote and fixing this big problem. And I think what's, what's missing is kind of that um, direct connection to your everyday life. And the more we can paint that picture and draw that bright line, the more we can start to create a coalition around it. So that's a really good point. I remember when uh, Senator Warner um, was governor of Virginia and they were battling some pretty terrible um, budget issues. Um, they had to close the DMV one day a week and that got everyone's attention. Mm -hmm. That touched everyone across sectors, across political spheres, across ideologies. Um, I think right now one of the obstacles that we have in front of us is that we look at debt 
as a very abstract concept, concept very far down the road. Um, and so we have to balance. We have to make sure that we're underscoring the severity of the issue without being too hyperbolic, without, being, without uh, violating the trust of millennials. Um, mm -hmm. And um, that is a fine balance that we have to do every single day. I think this trust issue is, is it seems to me, very central to this. Um, you know, we had, uh, since, since we announced this, uh, this event today, and I wrote a little piece uh, related to it uh, a couple of weeks ago, we've had a fairly lively uh, uh, input of uh, reflections on, on both this, this event in advance and on the piece I, I wrote. And I'd say the gist of, of, of certainly most of the email that was sent to me or the Twitter that was sent to me, I think they cut out a lot of the language of some of them, but some of them came to me, <laughs> basically said, you people, I, I think he means, this person meant economists uh, and people at think tanks and people roughly my age, uh, have been telling us every decade, you know, from the 60s, 70s onwards, that, that within 10 years, there's going to be economic disaster. And it just doesn't happen. And now you want us to believe it again? Uh, why should we pay uh, extra taxes, reduce benefits, and so on, cut things, uh, when you've never been true in the past? Uh, and I think that that's a big challenge for us. So, so I think trust is an issue. And then I think also translating to, to the locally, as you said, is really interesting. I mean, on the face of it, I would feel in, in, in general that climate change should be harder to do that because climate change involves the whole, country, the whole world, mm -hmm. other countries, and so on. So to kind of personalize that would be very difficult. But uh, I think, as later said, it, it, it has been successful. There are steps. People see this in a very direct way. And I just wonder again, uh, whether, what is it one could imagine in the debt and deficit area that could be made much more personal? Is it that we should be encouraging people to save more? Should we be encouraging people to have a, uh, a better lifestyle and improve their nutrition so they will need less um, medical care from Medicaid, Medicare in the future and so on? What, what's the individual action that could be equivalent here? It's not political paternalism, I can tell you that. Right. I think um, people on both sides of the aisle have had enough of that, telling us what certain people can use with their SNAP benefits, telling people that we have to pee in cops in order to get social services. Um, we're, we're done with political paternalism, okay. I think, as a strategy to employ. Um, I'm happy to say I'm, I'm, I represent a party that doesn't do it that much, but uh, it's something that we do have to move away from. Um, but I think we need to start calling people out. Um, I think. Again, we're back to this trust idea, right? We we cannot, you know, we, we cannot afford to help the most vulnerable vulnerable among us, but we can afford to go to war in places that we shouldn't have you know, any type of conflict with. We can't revamp the healthcare system; it's way too expensive. But we can do billion-dollar tax cuts for the top one percent of this country. It, it's a duality of, of inconsistencies, and I think a big strategy is making sure that we are calling out those who are giving us talking points as opposed to truth and um, heighten this conversation to the degree where it should be about something as important as climate change, which is an existential threat to this world, um, and the debt, which it could be a major threat to the most vulnerable among us right now. And, and let's humanize that. Let's put a human face on that so that we, again, are starting to not just tell someone something, but tell a story that people can identify with, connect with, like Congressman Kilmer had, had underscored mm -hmm. earlier. And uh, that maybe I could put you on the spot on this in terms of from what you laid out and for this conversation you've heard so far. What have you heard that um, really, uh, really strikes a chord with what the research is you mentioned? Is it what Eric's just said? Is it uh, what, what Layla said? So I've got about five pages of notes that I've taken okay. in the last few minutes. So that's <laughs> well, one, a, one page is sufficient. Yeah, one for, page is, <laughs> is sufficient. So I think the last five minutes are really kind of talking, not talking around as in avoiding it, but kind of circling around this common conundrum with both of these issues, which is fundamentally the solution is not individual action, <laughs> right? It's not, the solution to climate change is not turn out your lights. It's not compost. So I think that when you kind of look at that, um, together with this people's need for efficacy, you have kind of a second layer of conundrum. So if the, if the solution is not individual action, but if people need efficacy in order to engage, then you kind of have this tension. And my thinking is largely where um, Eric, is that right? Yes. Eric and Layla talked about kind of the importance of civic engagement as, as the individual action that I think is, is most 
important and appropriate um, on these issues. So you know, I've, I've been thinking a lot and kind of waiting, yearning to do work on how you frame kind of basics of civic participation to the American public in a way that encourages a better understanding of what a democracy is and how it works, which I kind of think we have um, forgotten in some ways. A lot of the funders who fund our work are interested in funding um, ideas of civic participation and democracy in far-flung places like, like Kenya or Bangladesh. Um, but I think a lot of work, um, a lot of that work needs to be redirected towards the context in which, in which we live and um, talking about civic participation in this country. I think it's also, so one other quick thought is a, a really key difference between two concepts. One is personalization mm -hmm. and the other is individualization. So personalization, yes. Right, so that we need to frame things in a way that resonates with people and that moves them in a direction. But the direction that we move them in cannot be individualistic. It cannot encourage people to think that problems are caused and solved by the will and character of individuals. To me, in the work that I've done over the last 12 years, that is one of the most obstinate challenges to to the change work that I'm trying to be part of, is the way in which people conceptualize these really complicated issues as being kind of narrowly about the will, grit, gumption, drive, choice of individuals, and how that occludes the, and this sounds a little geeky, but the systemic perspective that is necessary to engage in if we are actually going to address these, these big issues. So personalization, yes, by all means, but individualization, I think is a real, is a danger of, of, we're in danger of conflating those two things in this discussion. So I would encourage us to think about that. Everybody agree with that? <laughs> I don't know if I agree with that. Um, I, I don't know how I can agree with that when I know that individuals are the reason right now that the House of Representatives is blue. I think a lot of people individually looked at the, at the trajectory of our country and thought, um, I may be just one person, but I'm going to do what I can to turn my district from red to blue or to vote out someone who doesn't represent my values and doesn't, doesn't help uh, enrich or help improve the quality of my life. I think when you get individuals together in a group, I think that is when you actually start seeing those movements start to take shape and come to fruition. Um, but I agree. I think we can't conflate the personalization component to it either. I think we need to be able to play in both pools. But... Um, you know, I am the son of baby boomer parents who remind me every other day that they ended the Vietnam War um, and that they were in the streets and that they saw their friends go and, and individually they felt powerless, um, but they individually worked with their local groups, SDS, Students for a Democratic Society. These are young students who just did it on their own and they say they um, ended a war. And I got to tell you, I believe that. And I, I, I like being able to underscore the idea that, um, that even on your own, that you have the capacity to do something um, amazing, not just for yourself, but for your community and quite possibly your country. Yeah. I think, can I just yeah, jump in? Absolutely. And I think there's, I think both are actually kind of right. Um, <laughs> and just going back to the chart that you had up on the screen, Nat, of the, the um, like low efficacy, high urgency, and thinking about where we want to be in, that, in those quadrants, we're not living in a vacuum. And at any given moment, there's so many different um, of those quadrants being filled by so many different issues. And I think, back to your point, Stuart, about trust, I think we're, we're talking about this and we're framing this conversation in how can we get the public to trust the policymakers in terms of where to, how to create a solution. But I think we also have a challenge in getting policymakers to trust each other too. And we're not going to be able to, to separate the urgent and the important if we think that everybody else who's working on other urgent matters is not to be trusted. And so we have to double check their work. And while we're all double checking each other's urgent work, all the big important stuff is getting left to, for the next generation to solve. And so I think there's a crisis of trust internally as well before we can even think about, um, you know, how do we personalize this for, for the public? Um, how can we create this, um, this, this culture of trust internally among policymakers as well? And I think kind of just speaking to, to your points about the challenges and frustrations of um, how, to, how to move issues forward, it, it comes back to, to that 
our initial point of all understanding is is based on framing, and we're, we're, we need to shift our framing within our legislative bodies even before we can start to have that trickle out to the public. And we're, we're living as, you know, I think one of the things that Alec opened his remarks with is we're living in this period of extremely high polarization. And so the degree to which that and the um, incentives for short-term thinking just towards the next election among members of Congress make it difficult to build that kind of trust um, that is necessary to tackle longer term problems as opposed to um, just sort of sh shorter term uh, problem focused conversations more than solutions focused conversations is another way that structurally I think um, uh, Congress faces challenges in this area. Uh, let me open it up now to, to the audience and, uh, and to Twitter. Uh, you can send in uh, questions. Oh, we have one here, which I'll take in a moment. Uh, maybe if we could just start in the center here. My name is Susan Irving. I'm struck by the tension of your point about we're selling to a cable gener you know, we're trying to sell a cable package to a streaming generation. Um, and yet, if you look at the list of all the things people won't cut, and you add to that the list of people opposed to raising taxes, the only way to address the substance of the long-term fiscal challenge is to do both. How do you do that by letting people pick and choose? Because you generally, what you get is a package that won't work. So mm -hmm. basically, how do we frame that issue so people, so that it's a deal? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I think that, um, and anyone else jump in, but I think the, the, the spirit of my comment is more about the, the messaging itself about how to disentangle the idea of action on this long-term issue without assigning other completely unrelated issues just because of who the, the messenger might be or because of um, other things that you might know to be true about um, you know, that, that individual or that kind of institution. Um, and so I think you're, you're totally right. There is there's a, a big compromise that's going to need to be made to be able to take issue, but as we think about how do we separate? Um, how do we separate facts from identity, almost? And that, to me, seems to be one of the biggest challenges that we're facing, and mm -hmm. even taking the first step on this issue. Okay, maybe over here. Uh, my name is Jim Connors. Uh, interestingly, uh, Congressman Kilmer framed the day when he spoke with pride about his grandmother living for 38 years on Social Security. Isn't that a terrific framing for how wonderful Social Security and entitlements is? From what I've heard today, and I came with this notion, the, the pro biggest problem facing millennials is their enemy is their grandmother. <laughs> how would Nat frame that successfully? <laughs> Well, that's not fair. Come on. <laughs> Jeez. Tell us how you hate grand grandparents. <laughs> I've got your grandmother on the line here. <laughs> yeah, I'm not going to claim that I have the answer to that one. Um, I do think that uh, frames that create or prime zero-sum ways of thinking are incredibly toxic as they seep and spill past the issues in which we intend them to, to hold. Uh, and so um, kind of Othering and zero-sum thinking is one of my, my biggest um, concerns in doing the work that I do and how easy it is for people to, with very little priming, to fall into that, to think about everything as being a competition. And once you're in that kind of zero-sum mode, anything that's, that's able to be seen as for you and yours is by definition, I'm not pointing to anyone back there, uh, <laughs> is by definition less for, for me and mine. And so it's not a direct answer to your question, but I think that um, framing around the ideas of competition between groups is a, is, a really, is a really toxic frame, although in reality what you're saying is correct. So there's a difference between the social analysis and the communications analysis. So I'm, I'm in the communications analysis lane here. Well, maybe one thing to add on this, kind of grounded in our, our research, is you know, we, we try and ask people, to what extent do you perceive conflicts between 
older and younger people, better and less well-educated people, people of different races or different you know, ages. And at least in a self-reported survey, people really don't see this generational divide. It's not, it's not really salient for them right now. It's not to say that it couldn't become more salient, but as we stand here today, it's, it's not among the top conflicts uh, that the public sees. And there are other questions, there's other research we do. Does the government do too much, too little, the right amount for older people or younger people? The divides you get in response patterns by age are perhaps more modest than you might have predicted. So at least in the survey data, we don't see this generational conflict as primed as you might see other forms of conflict in the country, at least at the current moment. If I could just pick up on that, um, with a reflection really on, question. on your question. Um, uh, some years ago in the early 2000s, 2000 till the mid 2000s, when I was at the Heritage Foundation, uh, Heritage and the Brookings Institution uh, with the General Accountability Office, the head of the General Accountability Office and the Concord Coalition, undertook a project uh, called the Fiscal Wake Up Tour. And we actually went around the country uh, talking at primarily college, uh, colleges uh, about these issues of long-term deficit and debt and, and the problems associated with that. And the audience, it was at colleges, but, but, but typically the audience was roughly half uh, people who were student age and the other half were basically people who could be their grandparents. So we actually precipitated a conversation along the lines you just said in terms of who's taking, who's, who's uh, uh, the problem uh, and that the older generations are, in, the baby boom generation is in fact uh, running, uh, you know, depleting um, the opportunities for the future. And so we had this kind of pretty robust conversation. And, and a, p a potential reframing did develop during those conversations, not enough to get to public policy. But not, and let me just kind of run this by, by Nat, see what he thinks about it. We had a lot of older people coming to, uh, to the microphone, and they would say something like this. I hear what you just said about how we in Medicare and Social Security and so on are really draining the bank, and that this young person next to me who's already got $50,000 of college debt uh, he's not going to, he or she is not going to have what I'm able. I'm willing to forego some of my benefits. I've got a 401k, I've got some money in the bank and so on, uh, providing that Social Security and Medicare, I know, is going to be there if I need it and be sufficient if I'm running out of money in some way. I'm willing to give up uh, and, I'm, and I'm also willing to do that uh, to make to, to reduce benefits in something like Medicare, providing I don't get Alzheimer's. In other words, providing I don't get something which is going to mean I'm going to be enormous expense. So what, what was going on, it seemed to me, was a reframing to say, if we think of these retirement programs not as something I expect as a stream of income and a stream of benefits, but something that's there as an insurance policy against things going badly, and we had a lot of traction with that. Not enough to get legislation passed, I have to confess. But it was a, a, a reframing. Is that the kind of reframing uh, I, any of you think might um, get some traction in a broader audience today? Or are we too far beyond that? I would say it's never too late to try and reframe the conversation. And, mm -hmm. I, and, and going back to your comment, Jim, was it? Um, Grandma's not the enemy, but the, the enemy is the environment and attitudes that cultivated grandma's ideology right now. That this is not my particular problem. I will have this. I think it becomes redefining the metrics as well. So I'm from California, Southern California. I'm from a suburb of LA called Calabasas. Um, last year, we had a major fire, the Camp Fire, that destroyed lots of homes. Uh, a Northern California fire claimed the lives of, of dozens of people. Um, I will tell you that my friends who are Republicans who did not believe in climate change before that fire um, do now. And it's because they had the head of CAL FIRE explain, you know, wherever your political ideology is, that's fine, but climate change are making these fires stronger, they're increasing the volume, and they're making it more dangerous for everyone. So when we think of climate refugees, I think a lot of people think of people whose homes were buried underwater. We now need to reframe that and start thinking about people who no longer have homes because they are now burned up. And I think um, figuring out different ways to stay, as a communications professional, I'm going to throw this out there, to stay message discipline without saying the same thing over and over again, but finding new ways to underscore um, the stakes um, and, and we'd be able to redefine um, the metrics there. I think that 
will help us. And I don't think it's ever too late to try that because something as important as climate change or debt um, needs, we, we can't give up on the third try. We've we got to keep trying. I think that's the whole point. I certainly think we need to reframe the issue. Um, anybody else want to jump in on that? If not, I'll go to another question. There's a gentleman here. In the... uh, thank you. I'm Dave Rabinowitz. In 2000, the U.S. government ran a, a, a surplus in the budget, and people were talking about finally starting to pay down the debt, and polls typically said about 50% of the people said you should use the surplus to pay down the debt. There was this one poll where only 6% said pay down the debt. And I looked into it and discovered that the, there was no option that said pay down the debt. The option was don't spend it, which is equivalent to pay down the debt. But it didn't sound that way. And it turns out in polls in general, the results depend more on the wording of the questions, the order of the questions, and the script in general than on the actual opinions of the respondents, which is why polls generally support whatever position the funders want to support. I'm wondering, are there more polls of millennials based on, uh, by organizations that have different positions? And do their results look similar to the ones that Pew found? Yeah, I, th I think that I can take that. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I think, I mean, you, you were going to get it anyway. Yeah, right? <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, I mean, it's certainly true that the wording you use in a question, the order, or, or what themes you might prime can influence opinion. The effect of that uh, is greater or larger depending on how deeply held those opinions are today. For example, you could prime a lot of things in front of Trump approval, and my expectation would be it wouldn't change a whole lot because those attitudes are deeply held by the public and they have, they have strong reasons for believing the way that they do. So it's more often the case that on lower salience issues, you could see potentially more of a, an effect in the, in the results based on how the question is framed or written. You know, we're a nonpartisan, non-policy organization. Part of what we spend our days really grappling with is how to write this in the fairest, most neutral way possible. So we're very confident in our estimates, and I, I certainly would stand behind them. But to your question, could you get different results based on how it's framed? Ab ab absolutely. And I guess what I would say, though, some of the enduring dynamics are very robust across different wordings. For example, the large partisan divide and concern over climate change. Word the question however you like and you're going to get that large partisan divide. So I think my overall answer, of course it matters. It matters more for low salience issues, but some dynamics are so strong and so deeply held and so enduring that they'll express themselves across any type of wording you can come up with. And I think there are a lot of the same themes that we hit on today are robust across all methodologies. I have a question from, uh, from Twitter, through Twitter, uh, which, which I think nicely juxtaposes both these issues. And the question is, would borrowing today, in other words, increasing debt today, to address climate change be a wise investment uh, for the future? In other words, should we go even deeper into debt to solve this other question? Without a planet, I don't think the debt is going to be a major deal for us. Okay. So I think we should definitely be figuring out all of the options before us in terms of addressing climate change. Um, and, and this can be from an individual standpoint, it can be from a group dynamic, could be as a country, um, and particularly that has to start with leadership at the top. So we need to be able to have a, a government that will join its constituency in addressing those issues with the severity it demands. Um, but I, I, I think when it comes to saving the planet, um, we should be open to a, a plethora of different options, and we should also be listening to a diverse standpoint of opinions as well. Uh, Congressman Gomez, who I work for, likes to underscore the idea of environmental equity when talking about climate change, that those um, who are most impacted by the effects of climate change should be thought of, uh, you know, should be prioritized in any type of legislative prescription that we're going to devise. Um, we, when we talk about these issues, communities of color have a lot to say about them because they are, in most cases, m more impacted by those negative effects than other communities. So making sure that we have a diversity of opinions and a diversity of viewpoints as to how to solve these issues and how to address them, um, that, that is, I think, the only way that we're going to be able to move the needle in any direction. Layla, is that what you hear when you're out there listening to millennials? Yeah, I mean, I think you make a pretty compelling point without a planet to, to live on. There's not a whole lot of other issues that we can work on unless, I guess, we just, you know, colonize the moon or Mars or something. Yeah. Um, 
I, I'm struck by your, your comment about just engaging different um, constituencies, too, in this. We're actually about to do an event in a couple of weeks um, around the issue of, of climate and energy out in um, Wisconsin. And we'll hear from um, MAPS founder Stephen in a little bit. I'm sure he'll slip in a Wisconsin reference at some point. But uh, we're engaging the faith community around this issue with the um, idea of being good stewards of God's earth. Um, and so thinking about how can you frame these messages in ways that make it urgent for people now. And I think, um, you know, at some point you have to, you have to prioritize. Um, back to the original question of what can we do on an individual basis um, on the national debt, I think, you know, sometimes it's a tough answer, but sometimes it's nothing. It's work on other issues first so that we are in a better position to more effectively solve um, solve the next problem and do the do the triage in the in the order of urgency. Mm. Right. Any other comments? Good. I want to thank the uh, the panel for uh, walking us through this very complicated issue, and for the two presentations, particularly at, at the very beginning. So thank you. Thank you. Thanks for watching. Be sure to like and subscribe for more videos from Brookings.